Welcome to Hey on Haven, I'm Dawn. Today we're discussing chapter eight of the tale of Genji, Hana no En, a banquet celebrating cherry blossoms. We'll start with our usual summary for shared context. It's the following spring, Genji is now 20. Sometime after the 20th day of the second month, His Majesty the Emperor is holding a party in honor of the cherry tree near the Shishinrin. At the celebration, Genji dances a little at the behest of the Crown Prince, and His Majesty prompts Tono Chujo to dance, and then presents him with a robe. Many other courtiers also dance. Talented men from lowly ranks to scholars and imperial princes all draw words to be used in Chinese poems they write. Genji's poem draws praise and tears. After the party, while the palace sleeps, an inebriated Genji tries for an encounter with Fujitsubo, but the door is locked. He then wanders into the Kokiden. There he catches the sleeve of a woman who he carries off and has his way with. They exchange fans and he hurries away at dawn before they are discovered. The next day, a smaller, less formal banquet keeps Genji busy playing koto for his father. He has his retainers keep an eye out and they report to him that the lady had left the palace. Genji visits Murasaki and then his wife, Aoi, who ignores him. Genji plays music and is soon joined by Sadejin, his father-in-law, and his brothers-in-law. Meanwhile, Oborozukyo, the Lady of the Misty Moon, who Genji encountered in the Kokiden, is sad thinking of their affair, knowing her father plans to present her to the heir apparent in the fourth month. After the twentieth day of the third month, the Minister of the Right, Oborozukyo's father, Uraijin, holds an archery meet and banquet celebrating the wisteria blooming in his garden. Though specially invited, Genji has not come, and one of the minister's sons is sent with an invitation. At the encouragement of his father, the emperor, Genji gets dressed and goes to the party, making quite the fashionable entrance. After playing the koto for a while, Genji feigns being ill from too much drink and withdraws from the celebration, seeking out the women. He deliberately misquotes a saibara, saying his fan has been taken instead of his belt. One lady only sighs in response, and he goes to her, taking her hand and providing a poem. She responds with a poem of her own, and he recognizes her voice, knowing he has found his Oborozukyo. Those two poems are featured in the next Waka Wednesday. And once again, a bit of unpleasantness. In the video for Chapter 5, Waka Morisaki, I warned you that Genji was not by today's standards a good guy. He kidnapped a little girl and is grooming her to be the ideal woman. In chapter six, Suetsu Muhana, after promising to do nothing untoward, he just opened the sliding door and went in without invitation to the princess's private space. And don't forget Utsutsumi, Sakata, who he carried off, or her stepdaughter, who he slept with by mistake. And here we are again with yet another woman who Genji decides to have, carrying her off, and when she protests, he tells her it would do no good to call for help. Everyone yields to him and to just be quiet. We're seeing a pattern playing out in repeated sexual encounters with a distinct lack of consent. It can be really tough reading, and it's not going to get easier. Understanding the culture as it was then can be helpful in separating our knowledge of how wrong this is from the knowledge that this is essentially how it was, that it was expected and accepted. I don't want to spend this video discussing the topic further, but I will link to an article that discusses the subject in depth in the description down below. Before getting into some translation differences, I'd like to address Suematsu's omissions. Because this chapter is so brief, it's exceptionally easy to see what Suematsu left out. He once again has cut out the sex scene from the chapter. He also omits some of the clothing descriptions. So maybe reading all five translations is more like hearing the story from four friends who know how to dish, and one who leaves out some of the best bits. I find myself looking forward to chapter 18, when I'll only be reading the four unabridged versions. We once again have a gender difference. After Genji is hurried away from Oborozukyo, he returns to the Kiritsubo, his own apartments at the palace. There are a number of people in service there who pretend to be asleep when Genji comes through to lay down. Weili translates it as gentlemen, but our three later translators all say women. Suematsu didn't include this scene. Most of our other translation differences come in the descriptions of clothing or accessories, so we'll circle back to those when we get there. Let's discuss the seasonal references. This chapter covers one month. It opens just after the 20th day of the second month and ends just after the 20th day of the third month. 
That would be from late March to late April, essentially cherry blossom season. The chapter opens and closes on parties celebrating flowers, the first cherry blossoms, and while the second celebrates wisteria, it is specifically mentioned that there is a pair of late blooming cherries in the garden too. At the second celebration, Genji pretends to be drunk and withdraws, going to where the women are. They are seated and arranged so that their hems and sleeves peek out from beneath their curtains. Genji thinks this display, which reminds him of the New Year celebrations where this is common, is just a bit too much and a little inappropriate seasonally. Whaley gets this display that peeks under the curtains a little mixed up, saying they had hung bright colored robes and shawls over the windowsill. There is a coming of age ceremony mentioned. Udaijin, the minister of the right, had his house redecorated for, according to Suematsu, the mogi of Genji's half-sisters, the first and third princesses. Seidenstecker calls this an initiation ceremony. Tyler calls it the dawning of the train. In his glossary on clothing and color, Tyler defines a train as a mo, a long, sheer, decorated piece of cloth pleated into a sash tied at the front, at the waist, over the gown, uchigi, uwagi, and under the Chinese jacket, karaginu. A woman wore a train in service or on formal occasions to indicate a subservient position. I'm not so sure about the subservient position remark, and two corrections. The mo could be made of a heavier, opaque material as well. I have seen paintings with both sheer and opaque mo depicted, and the examples, the recreations at the Costume Museum in Kyoto, are not sheer, and the mo is tied over the karaginu. I highly recommend the Costume Museum for examples of the clothing worn throughout Japan's history. They also house a Genji exhibit of dolls in various depictions of chapters. There are links down below. Let's talk about what Genji wore to the second party. He took extra care in dressing and made such a fashionable entrance that even the flowers seemed to lose their luster. His outer garment is a sheer white Chinese damask. Whaley says it's lined in yellow, but Seidenstecker, Tyler, and Washburn translated as being in the cherry blossom style or white lined with red. Tyler translates this as a dress cloak, which in his glossary is a noshi. This is a casual garment we've talked about before, usually worn at home, and the color was not restricted to rank colors like the ho, more specifically the hoeki noho, which Tyler translates as the formal cloak. The two garments, the noshi and the ho, are essentially identical other than the color worn. Under this, Genji wears a garment with a train. Tyler calls it a train robe, but lists this as a shita gasane in the glossary. This is a garment that is worn as part of the Tsukutai ensemble that makes up men's formal court robes. Specifically, it's worn with a hoeki noho. The color of this garment varies a bit between our translators. Washburn calls it reddish purple. Tyler's grape means purple to reddish brown. Seidenstecker gives us magenta, and Whaley says deep wine red. Everyone else at the banquet was wearing formal court robes, the hoeki noho in the color their rank allows. This is why Genji made such a splash with his entrance. We're seeing an example of Genji being a fashion maven. He's combined a casual garment with a formal garment for a unique look. If I were to recreate a men's ensemble, this might have to be the one. An interesting tidbit, Whaley, in a footnote, says that Genji has no right to this outfit. Whether he had a right to it or not, this is a privileged man thumbing his nose at the rules because his status lets him get away with it. The last item I'd like to discuss is Oborozukyo's fan, the one she exchanged with Genji after their tryst. Four of our translators describe it as being in the cherry style, but Whaley describes it as a folding fan with ribs of hinoki wood and tassels tied at the splice knot. One side was covered with silver leaf, on which was painted a dim moon, giving the impression of a moon reflected in water. All of our translators agree that the fan has a misty moon that looks like it's being reflected on water on one side. Suematsu says the fan is obscured by a purple cloud. Seidenstecker didn't know what to make of the three-ply cherry fan, saying in a footnote, a somewhat mysterious object. One theory holds it to have had three-ply end ribs covered with pink paper. But Tyler and Washburn express no doubt about the fan. Tyler says in a footnote that the triple cherry blossom layered fan was triple because the fan with its eight cypress ribs folds into three panels together. The fan is white on one side and scarlet on the other, with a misty moon reflected in water painted on the colored side. This is our second lovely description of a fan. Perhaps someday I can make a copy of both of them. 
Maybe there are more fans described in the text. That could be a fun experiment, making all the fans from the Genji Monogatari. I'm enjoying being inspired to create things. Murasaki Shigibu gave us some wonderful details. In this chapter in particular, I think Tyler did the best job conveying them. What stood out for you in this chapter? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching. Join me next time for chapter nine, Aoi, Hollyhock, or Leaves of Wild Ginger. Subscribe if you'd like to explore the Heian period of Japan with me through the tale of Genji.